um, the, the putting in progress. So, so the regulatory environment is extremely dynamic, and it's as dynamic as the different uh, economies and markets that we all operate in. Um, and so we're extremely fortunate this morning to have a number of experts from both Clyde and Co and I2 on the panel to navigate some of the key trends and implications in the specialist insurance space. And, and we'll focus on a number of different countries and, and a number of different topics just to give you a good feel for kind of the complexity and how the landscape is changing um, on, on, a, on a monthly, weekly basis. And so we think it's, it's a really important topic, both for South African brokers who have clients operating in Africa, as well as you know, African brokers in, operating in, in each of the markets. So, so it's, a, it's a really good, good topic and, and, and excited to have a, a really great panel today. So I think for the first part of the session, um, let's chat about Southern Africa. We'll start kind of in, in the Southern part of, of Africa and through key regulatory considerations such as insurance legislation and, and local requirements. And, and so I've got joining me for the first section, Nicole Britton, who's a legal director at, at Clyde & Co. Welcome, Nicole. Thanks very much for having me. Pleasure, pleasure. So, so Nicole, um, as I too, our experience in SEDEC is that regulators tend to place quite a significant emphasis on protecting the local players in the insurance space from ownership to local content. Would you agree with that? And, and if you do, do you have any kind of examples you could share? Yes, very much so. I think we're seeing an increased trend, um, you know, throughout um, Africa in this regard. Uh, with a particular focus on increasing local ownership requirements within insurers and brokers. Um, I'll expand on that specifically with reference to Zambia, which is a very good example with, with reference to the new insurance legislation that's been promulgated. Um, in addition, we've seen a number of other markets in closing regulated sessions, which my colleague Jared will later be speaking on in the Kenyan market. If I focus just to Zambia, um, you know, there's been a long awaited insurance act that's been promulgated much the same that we saw in South Africa. It was quite a long wait and it really commenced as early as the um, December of last year, 2022. It's still to, to uh, that regulatory landscape. But what is quite unique to it is the local ownership requirements that are being imposed there. We're seeing insurers having an obligation to maintain not less than 30% of their issued share capital needs to be held locally uh, by local ownership, as well as by brokers that need to have not less than 51% must be maintained at all times locally through local residents. This really is driven by this need to you know, keep that ownership in-house and drive that sector from a Zambian perspective. And we're seeing similar trends throughout the uh, various jurisdictions as well in this regard. Interesting, thanks. And Nicole, do any of the other jurisdictions impose local ownership requirements within SEDEC? So, you know, Zambia really is a clear, good example of it, where we are seeing, for example, uh, changes that are coming to pass, and it's a unique situation, which is in Lesotho. They've had draft legislation, which actually was promulgated and then subsequently withdrawn, uh, which is quite fascinating in and of itself. Uh, but without boring you on that part, essentially in terms of the Business Licensing and Registrations Act, certain activities are... Uh, segregated for simply what they refer to as indigenous persons. That terminology of indigenous persons, however, is quite inflexible in its nature, um, meaning that it's reserved so, solely for the Sutu nationals permanent resident. And whether or not, you know, it's still not yet promulgated and enforced, so where we see it practically coming through is yet to be determined, but that is something that's in the pipeline and soon, um, you know, to have an effect within the Sutu itself. Cool. And, and then kind of shifting to a slightly different topic, would you, would you say that um, the, pro the promotion of local sessions and local underwriting capacity is, is increasing in the region from your perspective? Very much so. And I focus on Zambia only because it's uh, had this uh, novel piece of legislation, um, but it's not per se unique, um, you know, to Zambia itself. Jared will um, be touching, you know, more on this later. 
But essentially, in terms of the Zambian Insurance Act, it's quite clear and express in stating that no insurer as licensed in terms of that act is allowed to pay commission to any other person unless that person is equally licensed in that territory. And further to that, we're also seeing that no person can cause a Zambian insurer to place insurance with them. That's quite restrictive in its nature of tying the, you know, the business and the placements to very much local carriers, locally licensed entities. Um, the only exceptional deviation that we're seeing to this is that to the extent that there's a prior written approval uh, to the regulator in Zambia, indicating uh, grounds to take the business outside of Zambia with outside that territory. And that prior approval process is essentially an exemption akin to what we see in terms of Section 8.2 of the Short-Term Insurance Act, or if you're in Lesotho, what we see there for the um, you know, short-term and long-term, very similar basis as we see under the A2D. Essentially, what we're, what we're saying is if there's a lack of local capacity, you would then be favorably considered for that exemption, much the same as what we see in A2D. The one unique area, however, where the, um, you know, all things considered, and given that it's new legislation, and this is a trend still from the old, is that retrocessions are quite freely given, simply due to the lack of capacity in Zambia, in the Zambia market. So retrocessions are still very much open to placement outside of Zambia. But without your prior approval, you will fall foul and be subject to certain penalties under the Zambian legislation. Great. Thanks, Jan. And Zambia is a good, good, good market to focus on. We've seen quite a lot of changes there, even things like um, over the last couple of years, you know, the regulator imposing rules around dollar based policies and then kind of uh, doing away with that. And, and even more recently, uh, withdrawing the withholding tax on on reinsurance yes. you know, as pressure comes from international markets and the need for capacity in the local markets kind of supersedes that i guess yes absolutely um, yeah so so a, a nice market thanks nicole so i mean the other thing yeah i think we, we regularly approached by brokers um who have clients moving into new territories or, or that are multinational clients having to navigate the local requirements, particularly the one you touched on there in terms of having to uh, utilize a local registered intermediary. So a South African broker cannot trade directly in Zambia or any SADC market for that, ex for that re reason. Um, and, and so I think, yeah, as I too, we've got really good structures with our Hollard partners in the region to um, uh, deal with that kind of challenge and, and ensure that we issue good, strong local policies that are underwritten by Holod and ourselves. So um, we, we do have solutions to that. And it is quite an important piece, particularly for brokers with clients outside of their borders. Uh, then, Nicole, just on, on compulsory insurance, is that something we're seeing in SADC? We, we're going to get to it on Kenya, which is obviously a big thing there. But your views on the SADC market? Yeah, very much so. I mean, uh, Zambia itself, they, whilst they haven't yet promulgated uh, the percentages, you know, there are certain compulsory insurance and reinsurance that needs to be maintained at all time, or at least be made or offered to the local market, in particular to the National Reinsurance Company in Zambia, the Reinsurance Corporation, um, and, you know, ultimately the business has to be placed there and the only opportunity that you can take that reinsurance layer out of Zambia is if they decline and then you still need to go through that prior approval process that we've just mentioned so you know it's a lot of red tape um mm. it's not just a simple you know all right let's carry on the timelines in order to decline that business as well from those uh, mandated reinsurance is not prescribed um so there's definitely a need to keep it within Zambia and grow you know, ultimately for the economic benefit of Zambia, that market. Thanks. And then last question for you, um, Nicole, kind of on a, on a global scale, um, cybercrime is certainly one of the major risks, both for businesses and individuals. You know, with South Africa recently uh, sort of launching the Protection of Personal Information Act, so PUPI, um, what is the trend regarding data protection in, in the rest of SADC? So most of SADC has DPA or data protection legislation. Um, we're not unique, sadly, South Africans, um, save for Mozambique and Namibia. 
Uh, in terms of Namibia, they've got a draft protection bill that was released um, you know, as early as November 2022. It's still subject to uh, discussion and debate. Still remains a draft, but that is forthcoming. Uh, However, in Botswana, we see quite a, you know, nuance in that environment, which hopefully could translate into something for South Africa. So, you know, spinning things around a bit um, in the sense that Botswana for the, you know, taking data out of Botswana, cross-border data transfers are highly regulated, in fact, restricted in totality, unless you are transferring to a country that has equivalent protections. And what constitutes equivalence is essentially a list that they've released of various entity, uh, countries that are suitable. Uh, for example, South Africa is, of course, listed on there. That will be quite important if you're doing business uh, from South Africa uh, into Botswana and dealing with Botswana nationals in order to transfer that data out. We are on that list, and it will be interesting to see whether our information regulator and Dopopi, who equally has a similar provision to say, you know, you can only do it if there's equivalents um, in terms of that protection. We're going to see a similar list being released to us. So time will tell, and there'll be some learnings there, hopefully, that we can leverage from Botswana. Um, from a Zambian perspective, quite an interesting point to note when you're dealing with data protection is there is a localization requirement. So any information regarding a Zambian data subject must be localized and kept onshore within Zambia. You can't, for example, keep your storage if you've got cloud management sitting abroad from Zambia, simply hosting that data outside of Zambia. There is a localization element to it, which that in and of itself can be quite costly as well. So those are those are just some tidbits on the data protection trends that we see. Cool. No, that's great. And, and hopefully everyone on the call knows that I too is a market leader in, in the cyber insurance space, both at a personal, uh, personal cyber level as well as, as, well as uh, and, and commercial as well. So yeah, a little bit of a marketing for our cyber team as well. We're a fantastic team. Thanks so much, Nicole. Really, really appreciate the, your time and the insights um, on these issues. I think fantastic um, feedback. Um, let's kind of shift a little bit east now. Um, so, so following the rollout of I2's very successful partnerships and local offices in Namibia, Botswana, Mozambique, Lesotho and Zambia, at the beginning of May, so was, what, three weeks ago, um, our very own Mark Lovett um, relocated to Nairobi to set up and run our East African operation. Uh, this is in partnership with APA, who are the number one insurer in Kenya. So Mark's in Nairobi, great to have you on the line, Mark. Um, and at the same time, Clyde & Co have also opened up their Nairobi office and Jared Kangwana, who's the senior partner based in Nairobi, who's just um, joined on the line there, as you can see. Jared and, and Mark are joining me for this section of the discussion. And super excited about East Africa. It's a fast growing region um, and, and lots of opportunities, I think, for all of us. Jared, maybe, you know, for, for those of us who aren't aware, can you just maybe kick off with what the relevant legislation is that governs insurance in, in Kenya? Absolutely. Thank you, Deb. I think I'll just put a warning out there now. We're, we're having a few uh, power issues here, so if I do drop out, I'll try and join uh, as quickly as possible. Um, but to your question, um, in Kenya, really, the, the Insurance Act is the principal legislation that governs insurance and reinsurance business in Kenya, um, and, and also establishes the IOA, the Insurance Regulatory Authority, whose functions include the regulation, supervision, and licensing of insurers and reinsurers in Kenya. Now, uh, over and above that, the regulator does also issue uh, guidelines and circulars to uh, all players in the insurance, in, in insurance industry, um, which are legally binding. Now, in most cases, these regulations and guidelines are, are issued to accommodate a, a maturing and more sophisticated insurance market in Kenya, and, and really tries to mitigate um, errors uh, in the Insurance Act, um, which, which were not um, uh, fully contemplated when, uh, when initially drafted. Thank, thanks, Jared. I mean, a lot's been said, and we've heard a lot about the fact that Kenya has strict um, local coverage requirements. Can you maybe give us some specific detail on that? Um, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, in principle, yes, and I'll get to the detail of it. Yes, Kenya is very strict in that regard. We do see a lot of slippage, and, and I believe that the regulator is aware of it, but by and large has uh, kind of turned a blind eye to it. So, Yes, the law is strict in that regi uh, registration with the regulator uh, as an underwriter is required to carry out insurance business inside and outside of Kenya. 
in respect of Kenya business, except Kenya business that is solely reinsurance business. So it's a bit concrete, and I'll get onto the reinsurance bit shortly. Now, the definition of Kenya business is, is quite wide and really has two prongs to it. The first part is uh, insurance business carried on by an insurer in respect of any person, human life, property, or interest situated in Kenya. That's part one. The second part um, is in respect of which premiums are ordinarily payable in Kenya. Now, it's always been our interpretation this, this definition does have two triggers, and from the drafting are mutually exclusive. So for players in the market, it's quite easy for them to be caught in uh, caught under the definition of, of Kenya business. Moving on to reinsurance business. Now, regardless of whether the risk is reinsured by a local or foreign reinsurer, um, these risks are, uh, are, are subject to mandatory uh, uh, sessions to three regional uh, reinsurers. Uh, and now as a percentage of the total risk and premium that has to be ceded, um, the breakdown is as follows. Uh, 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 so to Kenya Reinsurance Corporation, 20% uh, uh, on both life and general business lines, Africa Reinsurance, 5% uh, again on both life and general business lines, and ZEPRI, 10% again on both life and general uh, business lines. So in totality, uh, with any single policy, you're looking at a mandatory session of about 35%. Now, that being said, it should be noted that these regional reinsurers can to underwrite the risk. Now, in which case, such, uh, such proportion that has been declined can be ceded to a reinsurer of the insurer's choice, subject to the approval of, of the regulator. Now, again, second part of this, notwithstanding a reinsurer declining to take up the risk, the regulator will still require a portion of risk to be retained by, a local, by the local insurer which in effect means it's not possible to cede 100% of, of any risk. Uh, local retention is really determined uh, on a case-by-case -case basis by the regulator, and we've seen local retention being pegged at anywhere between 5 and 25%. Oh, no. That's enough breathing for you. Yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, I think that's a really, really important point, Jared. And, and as I too, we've learned a lot in the last two to three years on the reinsurance side with APA. So we've We've got a quote to share treaty that's approved by the regulator because reinsurance treaties need to be signed off by the regulator in, in November, December of each year for the following period, January to December. And, and yeah, that quota share treaty has local uh, reinsurers on it, ZEPRI in, in the main. And uh, so, you know, that makes it far more efficient for us to underwrite risks together with APA um, in that we've got a you know, pre-agreed treaty where the business flows through there and it just makes it a lot easier. And both for the for APA and the and the broker and customer to to get you know specialist covers that, that they that they need. Um, kind of bring it to I two then kind of our fastest growing product by, by a margin I'd say in the last twelve months has been um, professional indemnity. Is that because professional indemnity is compulsory in Kenya or is that yeah I'm just keen to get your views. No, so. Uh, 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 is, is compulsory only in certain in certain sectors. Now, these include uh, medical practitioners and dentists, uh, advocates, architects, uh, and, and, and engineers. Now, while insurance is mandatory in these sectors, there are no prescribed minimum policy limits. So uh, in, in more cases than not, professionals are opting to go for very low policy li uh, limits to save on premiums, which still in any case, a lot of premiums are funded through, uh, through IPF. Uh, we see exceptions, um, for example, where a tendering, a government tendering process, uh, for example, requires a PI cover of, uh, of a certain limit. But I think moving slightly off track a little bit, um, which I'm sure you're very well aware about, on a, on a very general note, insurance penetration in Kenya is still very low as compared to South Africa, for example. We're looking at 2.9 to 3 percent. Uh, penetration with a bulk of risks right now uh, being underwritten, stemming from mandatory insurance and possibly predominantly motor uh, motor insurance. Yeah, I, I mean, I think the the penetration one's a really interesting one and something, as I say, we're coming to understand having operated in Kenya for the past 24 months more actively. Um, and so I think it'd be a good point now, Mark, could you maybe give some, some perspectives on kind of what we're doing as I2 to try and tackle this kind of really low penetration in, in our lines specifically. Absolutely, thanks Dale and great to join the audience from Nairobi today. 
Um, the points Jared yeah, made Jared. around insurance penetration in East Africa are spot on. And we see even lower penetration levels in the less traditional insurance lines like our liabilities, so PI and so on. We have seen that most East African liability requests are driven either by licensing or contractual obligations, as Jared pointed out. The general feedback we have received from the market is that there's a lack of specialist niche knowledge. We have also received feedback that products such as PI and cyber are complex for the market to understand, and that oftentimes the process to sort a quotation is overly complex and cumbersome with reams of paperwork to, com to be completed and a lot of supporting documentation that needs to be submitted. We have tried to simplify this process as far as possible by introducing what we are calling InstaQuotes to the East African market. We started this initiative with our professional indemnity product, reducing our proposal form from six pages to one page of key underlying questions. We have also included minimum under, underwriting criteria, and if the client meets the parameters set out in the InstaQuote, the InstaQuote will also give the broker an indication of the limit, deductibles, and the price that the client can expect to pay. This has definitely led to a noticeable increase in the uptake of our PR product, and we are definitely looking to roll out similar InstaQuotes for our other specialist niche products. Brilliant. Well then, Mark, cool, and good luck. I think that's it's going really well so far, so, so great work. Um, I mean, Jared, on, on the subject of, of experts and specialists, what are you seeing the sort of need for specialists from brokers, insurers, loss adjusters, attorneys, uh, evolving in Kenya? Yeah, I think Mark, Mark, Mark may, may have already answered this question, but <laughs> um, I think, you know, as, as with a more sophisticated, uh, or rather more sophisticated client needs, more so the speciality on it, um, these simply have to be supported by, by, by experts. Now, um, while the market is maturing, uh, and I say this with all due respect, local players in the insurance sector are arguably still quite traditional in their approach and, pro and product offering. Now, uh, that being said, I think on-ground presence is critical, exactly what I2 is doing, uh, as opposed to applying flyout fly -out model where experts are specialists are looking in and out. Um, now, I see an immediate need for experts and specialists right now with the principal role of training and upskilling local talent and, and, and actually educating the market. Right. Cool. That's our mantra. So that's great to hear. Um, can, can you maybe comment briefly on, on data protection for the region as, as Nicole did a little bit earlier? Yeah, so I'll focus on Kenya at, at this point. I think our, our neighbors in, in, in Uganda and, uh, and Tanzania are, are following suit quite quickly and we will probably see similarities. Um, or other borrowings from Kenya uh, in due course. So Kenya enacted uh, the data, data Protection Act in 2019, and this regulates the processing of personal data uh, and provides for rights of individuals and obligations of data controllers and processes. Um, now, from our observation, the act closely resembles the GDPR, uh, not, not, not too many variances there. Now, as, as, as entities in the insurance sector collecting a lot of personal data from customers, um, insurance companies just have to register with the Office of the Data Commissioner. Um, policyholders have rights to be informed of uh, the use of and access and object of processing all of their data. Now, the Office of the Data, Pro, uh, uh, data Protection Commission is still relatively new and you yet to see any fines or penalties being awarded um, against insurance companies for non-compliance uh, with the DPA. Um, now, that being said, I think everyone should be wary that in the event of non-compliance with an enforcement notice that is issued, um, on conviction, one is subject to a fine of up to about $44,000. Um, or to uh, imprisonment for a term not exceeding two years or both. Okay, okay. Interesting, thanks. That's hello very useful. So let me just last, maybe a quick comment on Tanzania before we move over onto kind of the claims and litigation section. Is, is, that, is Tanzania similar to Kenya from a local coverage perspective? Yes, Tanzania is very similar to Kenya in that regard. Uh, Non-admitted non uh, uh, insurance business is not possible in Tanzania. Uh, Tanzanian residents or companies must get the insurance coverage from an insurance company in Tanzania, uh, and this is regardless of the type of insurance that they need. If one is unable to find a Tanzanian insurance company that offers a particular type of insurance, then at that point they may engage a foreign insurance company with the approval of the, uh, uh, of the commission. 
uh, now, as long as this is this is fed through a local Tanzanian company very similar to Kenya, and we see you know quarter share structures being being put in place um, in in Tanzania. I think an added step that Tanzania has and Kenya doesn't is any foreign reinsurer must be accredited by the uh, regulator Kira prior to yeah. accepting any insurance risk. Yeah, and, and that's had a direct um, implication on, on I2 and Hollard, and, and I, you know, I think it costs $10,000 per annum to, to get that, that license and then to renew each year as well. So we do, do have that in place as, as Hollard Insurance and I2, hence the ability to trade and, and write reinsurance out of Tanzania. So th thanks for that. And um, let's kind of shift gears a little bit now away from the regulations to to kind of litigation and, and claims examples in Africa. And while you've got the mic there, Jared, um, let's, let's kind of keep with Kenya, but could you perhaps provide some comment on litigation in Kenya and how the legal system actually works? Sure, so most insurance disputes in Kenya have traditionally been resolved through litigation in courts. Um, however, our constitution encourages the use of alternative dispute resolution mechanisms such as arbitration to solve disputes. Um, what we've uh, observed as parties to insurance disputes now are becoming more open to the idea of uh, resolving insurance disputes through ADR mechanisms. Now, the, if one were to go down the, the court process, um, the choice of court and forum to litigate uh, insurance claims depends on factors such as the nature of the claim uh, or the value of the claim. Our magistrate courts, which is the lowest court in the country, can only determine certain insurance disputes based on the pecuniary limits. Currently, a magistrate court can only determine an insurance dispute where the value does not exceed 20 million shillings, give or take $135,000, uh, and disputes of high values um, can be determined in, uh, in the high court. Now, I think my last point to this is, uh, and, and part of the reason we're seeing a shift towards um, ADR, is the inefficiencies in the Kenyan in the Kenyan court system, uh, and these are general, not specific to uh, uh, not, not not specific to insurance disputes. The main inefficiency is the time taken to resolve uh, any disputes. Generally, these could be anywhere from one year to three years uh, to reach any conclusion, um, uh, assuming that the initial judgment is not uh, is not appealed. Now, this has been okay, uh, occasioned mainly by the backlog of cases uh, and the lack of uh, adequate human and financial resources. I think as, as, as a statistic, um, according to the State uh, of Judiciary Annual Report that we looked at recently, the number of high court judges uh, handling more than 82,000 pending cases was only 36% of the high court's establishment, and at the magistrate's court, only 49%. Yeah. Interesting. Thanks, Jared. R really, really appreciate your kind of really on the ground practical insights into to Kenya. That's fantastic. We do have a couple of questions coming in, um, which we'll address at the end. Guys, um, please, I didn't say up front, if you do want to ask questions, why don't you pop them in the Q&A bubble, uh, easier for us to just track that, and we hopefully will have um, enough time at the end to answer uh, most of the questions, if not, we'll um, certainly get back on every single question um, afterwards. Um, so, so claims and, and litigation is certainly where, you know, from an insurance perspective, where the rubber hits the road, um, and provide great examples of, of how regulations and, and the legislation is, is interpreted and executed in, in country. So for the next section now, um, I've, I've got um, Vim Saliers and, and Dani LaRue, senior partners in, at Cloud & Co, who have years and years of extensive experience in claims and litigation in all of the territories that, that we'll be discussing. And so it would be, it's going to be good to chat through their experience and, and get their insights now. So first question is, is for, for Vim. Vim, let, let's start with Namibia. In your view, is Namibia, uh, from a litigation point of view, a risky landscape to, to navigate? Thank you, Doug. Before 1990 and before the independence of Namibia, um, South African legislation was also applicable in Namibia. And your old pre-1990 legislation remains applicable until today insofar as it has not been repealed and replaced with new legislation. Um, Namibia has also over time developed its own legislation, but even your new legislation in some respects tend to follow the general approach followed in South Africa. Um, South African case law 
is also used as guideline. And uh, courts in Namibia have over time obviously also developed its, its, its own case law. The common law in Namibia is similar to the South African common law, and the courts in Namibia until today use uh, South African precedents and case law in the development of, of common law. To, I would say to litigate in Namibia actually almost feels like litigating in South Africa. Um, I would therefore categorize Namibia from a litigation point of view as a, as a fairly safe jurisdiction. Um, the fact that the legal system is similar to South Africa with the, with the same and similar legislation and case law precedents make it uh, for us a fairly um, easy jurisdiction to, na to, to navigate legal risks. Um, the court system is like in most other jurisdictions in South Africa, fairly slow, with numerous pre-trial and case management processes. Um, the quality of judgments, in my experience, is similar to the quality in South Africa. You get excellent judgments, and you do get your, your bad judgments. Um, arbitration is becoming more and more popular. Um, as dispute resolution mechanism, and the South African Arbitration Act uh, is, in fact, applicable in Namibia. In my experience, some insurers with business in Namibia prefer to take uh, claims control in South Africa. Um, in matters where, for example, manage matters out of South Africa, we would use a reliable correspondent network and Namibia Council, and if necessary, even South African Council, who can appear on a case-to-case -case basis as counsel, as they can be admitted uh, in specific cases. Um, I don't think I don't think claims control is is too challenging, as the legal system is similar, as I've already mentioned, and one can can to a large extent rely on one's own legal instinct to take strategic decisions. Um, Teams meetings nowadays have also eliminated the need for unnecessary travel, which, which actually make it more cost effective as well from a claims control perspective and management perspective. Excellent. Thanks, Pim. And, and like, how would a country like uh, Mozambique, for example, compare to South Africa and Namibia? I would say that Mozambique is compared to Namibia a very uncertain year. Um, the legal system is a mixed legal system of Portuguese civil codified law and uh, customary law. Um, legislation is the primary source of law as well because it's codified. And um, language is a barrier in that legislation is in Portuguese and the courts also use Portuguese as an official language. Um, it's also very important to note that Mozambique follows Portuguese prescription periods, the old Portuguese civil codes in some respects. Um, and prescription can in some instances vary between 20 and 30 years, depending on the nature of the cause of action, for example. Um, so the prescription factor is therefore uh, definitely an important consideration to take note of in managing insurance risk exposure. The court system, um, can be, in my experience, fairly unpredictable. Um, it is from a claims control and management point of view, definitely also more challenging than, for example, in Namibia, uh, to take strategic decisions if you manage the claims risk out of South Africa, but I would say it's doable. And in fact, I think it's preferable if you, you can, in partnership, manage the process with a reliable correspondent to guide you on process and substantive elements of the case, and then uh, as insurance attorney and the expert in specialized insurance lines, you can then take the lead on the, the plan strategy side and, and, and work as a partnership. Um, if possible, also, I would advise insurers to rather follow the arbitration process, if possible, as a dispute resolution mechanism, as one can then address the Portuguese language barrier and in the process also avoid the, the unpredictable nature of courts. Great, thanks. Yeah, so certainly totally different, even though both are on our, our borders. So great, great insights there. Um, um, can you maybe comment more specifically on, on specialist insurance then? On the professional indemnity level, the, 
the landscape in Namibia is now experienced fairly similar to the South African landscape. We, for example, do see claims against engineers, attorneys, doctors, accountants, but obviously um, on a much smaller scale. On the general liability side, we've been involved on complex environmental related oil spillage and pollution claims. So my impression is that the plaintiffs are in general not hesitant to, to, let it, to, to, to let it go. And the courts do have the ability and the capacity to deal with fairly complex matters. Um, we are, for example, busy uh, with the matter against banks in Namibia as well, with features very similar to the well-known Baracom, please call me, case in South Africa, where the plaintiffs allege that the, the, the banks used the novel idea, their novel idea in composing a platform on which a mobile phone network subscriber could interact with service providers by sending an SMS to their mobile phone phones. Once again, a trend that we see that came from South Africa. Um, in Mozambique, the matters that I've handled the, the, are mainly construction related. And uh, we haven't really talked about Lesotho. Um, Lesotho's legal system, or the, the court system, in my experience, is fairly inefficient. Um, I've recently, over the last few years, actually saw a few med mal claims. But those claims we, we were involved in were driven by South African experts. Okay. okay. And, and, those, and those med mal ones, I mean, did they take a long time to, to work through or, or were they relatively straightforward? No, a long time also because it's still, um, my impression is it's still novel in the city. We've got the risk to deal with the claims in South Africa, and they're busy to invent the, the, the process. Yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, you've touched on it, and you've referenced um, partnership, local partnerships. So maybe just chat about Cloud & Co's approach to litigation in Africa in particular. The firm operates a hub strategy with integrated Cloud & Co offices in various regions in Africa. And the hub is being uh, complemented by strong relationships with the uh, local council through the firm's regional resource center consisting of a network of correspondence in, in, in various jurisdictions. Um, we also manage many litigious matters in various jurisdictions in Africa, directly from South Africa, by appointing the local correspondents on the ground to guide us on process and substantive elements. And uh, we then, in partnership with those correspondents, take the lead and advise insurers on claim strategy and approach. Um, many insurers prefer to have the claim, claims control in South Africa, and the, the strategic relationships with correspondents and in other jurisdictions do therefore create a win-win solution in that we have the benefit on the ground of procedural and substantive input, and we can, with our own experience in various specialized lines, then advice on uh, strategy and approach yeah i think and i think those principles are similar to how we how we kind of approach specialist insurance in africa so there's, there's a strong alignment and kind of approach there that, that we would we would certainly follow as well and um, would be good now donny just to bring you in um given your vast experience on the continent as well um donny kind of in your view, how does how do the legal systems differ from country to country and, and even region to region? Morning. Thank you very much for uh, inviting me to talk to you. I think uh, experience across Africa mirrors very largely what Bim and Darren spoke about. Uh, it's a vast continent made up of countries with their own uh, legal systems anchored for uh, a large part in the common law they inherited from the colonial powers. But, you know, the calls I, I often get, coming mostly, I should say, from some claims in North America, is, can you quickly help us? We got this case in Rwanda or South Sudan, as if 
they are just next door. And we all know what uh, the legal system is in that country. So what that tells, and particularly, I think, speaking to brokers who have clients who wish to do business in Africa, is that the first thing they must understand is what is the legal system that applies in a particular country? You need local knowledge. And it is through that uh, up and spoke system that Wim spoke about that we are able to penetrate the market and make sure we get the right advice. There was a question I saw uh, earlier on about the regulatory position in Zambia, uh, sorry, in Malawi. And I remember having a case uh, in which the question came up as to whether South African law that was incorporated in the treaty could be applied to the dispute uh, with the local insurer in Malawi. And I remember the claims handler and one of the of my team discussing South African law and how that might not apply. And because I've had a case there before, I had to uh, tell them that there is actually legislation that prohibits the enforcement of foreign law uh, through a treaty uh, arrangement. So in the end, we had to go for local advice on uh, how the law uh, was interpreted. So as also mentioned by them, legal outcomes in some of these countries are difficult to predict. Uh, there is an absence of case law. It becomes quite difficult to give advice on outcomes. Uh, so we need to make sure that we have the right people on board from the beginning. Call that came one uh, Monday to please help with the matter in South Sudan uh, was dealt with by phoning our office in Tanzania to say, can they help? And by wonderful cooperation, they were able to dispatch someone to South Sudan in the middle of the uh, civil war to go and help. So experience in the courts in these countries have been mixed, has been, mentioned, they take a long time to resolve. Janet, I'm pleased to hear it only takes three years for a case to get to completion in Kenya. It can take much longer, I assure you, even in South Africa, and a hell of a lot longer in Mozambique. I think the oldest case in my cabinet is about 12 years old uh, in Mozambique. So, yeah, Dale, I think uh, it's... it's uh, a question of know the continent, know the countries, uh, have local knowledge. I'm always asked, particularly when I go and talk to underwriters in London about bribery and corruption and so on, uh, particularly involving the bench. I've not personally uh, had any direct experience of that. I had one case in Zambia where my correspondent phoned the night before uh, uh, the case was due to be called saying that he said that the uh, uh, other side is bribed the judge. Uh, we overcame the problem by the correspondent not pitching up for the roll call the next day, which caused the matter to be postponed. And apparently uh, because the same judge uh, was not allocated on the next call, we never heard of the case again. They evidently didn't have money to bribe the next judge. Okay, interesting. So, so Donnie, given these risks, how would you, and you touched on it, but how would you mitigate and manage the risks in, in the African countries? I think one of the best ways to do so is to make sure that you have a good contract, a good policy, and that its dispute resolution mechanisms operate in a manner that will allow you to pick your own arbitrator and the law that is to be applied 
uh, to the dispute. So we possible if you are able to insert dispute resolution clauses incorporating the laws of a territory you're familiar with such as the laws of England uh, or the laws of South Africa, then that would be, I think, a good idea. Now, the one thing you must know is that litigating in Africa can be expensive. I think insurers and brokers and insurers must take that into account uh, in any uh, risks they, they undertake. Local lawyers mostly charge uh, in hard currency and uh, they want upfront uh, payments. So because you mostly involve your own corporate attorneys in managing the case, giving some input uh, strategically and so on, the net result is that it is quite expected to litigate in, uh, in some of these countries. But the other thing to do is, of course, to make sure that you have the right cover. Uh, for example, social and political stability uh, in some African countries uh, have become a problem. Loss or damage caused by uh, or as a result of political violence uh, is, is not normally covered by policies. So you've got to make sure that you have political risk cover for. I have a matter in Mozambique where, due to the insurgency in the north, uh, the property was damaged, and the issue now is whether or not uh, the terrorism exclusion applies. So it's very important to know that you've got the right cover and sufficient cover for the circumstances that may prevail in that country. Cool. And, and then kind of what's your experience been in terms of working with, with local experts then, Donny? Well, local experts uh, are hard to come by, particularly in specialist areas. If you have large scale infrastructure projects and you need local engineers, knowledge and experience, uh, they are really difficult to come by. Uh, the result is that in most of the big infrastructure projects, you will have uh, multinational contractors and professional advisors who are, are advised, uh, involved rather, and most of those uh, contracts would be governed by dispute resolution clauses incorporating foreign law. I had a matter in the context of climate change, for example, uh, one was a, a uh, hydroelectrical plant in Rwanda. And uh, the, there was a, a significant storm that damaged the infrastructure. And the question that came up from a PR perspective was whether or not the engineers designed the plant uh, to the correct standard. And that was quite tricky because it turned out that for historical uh, reasons, there was an absence of uh, sufficient data, weather data going back long enough to determine what was the standard to which the plant had to be uh, uh, designed. So local uh, expertise, local knowledge uh, is an essential that you need to have on site when you deal in some of these countries uh, in business. Uh, Dale, I think you're on mute. Sorry, sorry, my laptop decided to shut down, so I, I had to <laughs> switch over to my phone, so apologies for that. Um, thanks, Super. Um, th thanks, Dani. I think that's great, great advice. Um, last, last question for you, Dani, and then I would like to bring our uh, two claims experts. But um, have you seen a not no any kind of noticeable increase in specialist liability claims in Africa? Um, not really. 
but it would be a grave mistake to think they don't uh, uh, come around because I have seen some of them, I've dealt with them. I have seen uh, uh, an uptick in the number of claims, for example, made against banks. I've certainly seen uh, uh, claims against directors and officers of uh, uh, mostly foreign companies operating in some of these countries. So it would be a grave mistake to, to think those claims don't happen. I've won, uh, for example, in the DRC against the bank for about 10 million US dollars for the wrongful release of, um, of, a, of security. So these claims uh, come about and the clients, the insurers, would be well advised to make sure that they have the right sort of cover to uh, protect themselves against those kinds of issues. Excellent. Thanks, Donnie. Okay, I'm back on my laptop now. So, um, so I'd just like to conclude, and, and we've got a couple of questions, um, but, but I'd really love to get the perspective of um, Sipa Mandla, who, Magubane, who's I2's um, Africa Claims Manager and, and has significant experience in our, all of our markets as well um, over the last few years. Sipa, welcome and thanks. Sipa, in your view and, and your experience, what type of claims have you been seeing through our Africa desk? Yeah, thanks, Dale, and hi, everyone. I like uh, Danny has nicely put it, and as we did earlier, the rubber has been hitting the, the road more often than not uh, over the last uh, couple of years, let's say three or so. We've seen quite a, a huge, large claims from uh, a general liability perspective, more products liabilities, and we've also seen quite a number of public liabilities. And yeah, like uh, Danny has said, financial institutions, there's been a lot of claims coming through against them, as well as the PI attorneys. So there's been overall across the board and med medical malpractice, uh, DNO, commercial crime, political violence and terrorism. So across the board, we're definitely getting busy. So yeah, we are, we are the, things are happening out there. So the perception that there's no claims coming out of other, other countries, uh, those days are long gone. Cool. And then Dani, uh, Sipa, could you, um... Maybe just comment from, you know, sitting in Johannesburg, how we as I2, how the kind of claims process works on, on Africa claims. Perfect. Uh, with, uh, with our assistance, basically, uh, uh, we, we collaborate and uh, the claims are handled with our whole lot of claims partners within each country. And uh, in, uh, like in Namibia, Zambia, it will all would be partnership with the claims team. And then in Kenya, obviously, with APA. And so far, the process has been seamless for the insurers from appointing a, a, a relevant uh, experts in terms of attorneys, adjusters, in terms of communication. So up until the claim is sort of handled, uh, settled or even other sort of situations is rejected, which we always do so amicably. And uh, as well as any other issues have been, uh, there hasn't been any issues, let me put it like that. So the process has been seamless and the accounting obviously happens behind the scenes internally. So everything has been working quite well. Brilliant. Awesome. Yeah. Thanks, Sipa. That, that's fantastic. Cool. And um, I see we've got five minutes. So th thanks to all the panelists, um, all the great insights. As you can hear, everybody, it's a pretty kind of complex and, and ever-changing environment to navigate. So I'm happy to do that with you and your and your clients and and really appreciate the input of Cloud and Co. Um, hopefully we can answer a couple of questions now without throwing any of my colleagues under the bus. Sipa and Mark, do you mind? My the comment section have gone blank um, as I've logged back in. So I can't see if anything actually. Um I saw Pankaj, who's in Nairobi. Pankaj, welcome, great to have you on board. Mark asked a question a bit earlier before I was was logged off on, on land values and PI. Mark, are you able to, to answer that? And also, can you just, as you're answering that, check if there's been any other question I did see, I think Carmeny asked one on MedMail for Vim. So, and Jared's got his hand up as well. Um, Happy to do that for you, Dale. Um, and yeah. thanks for the question, Pankaj, and welcome on the session, glad you can make it. Um, so property valuers is actually quite a hot topic in Kenya at the moment, and we're seeing a flood of requests. I think that's primarily driven by the banks. Um, so 
property values on their panels. Um, so we're seeing big limit requests and those are kind of driven by contractual requirements. Um, notably, we've actually seen quite a lot of complex claims in that area in Kenya specifically. Um, so we do tread with caution when it comes to property valuers, but like any standard request, um, there's a proposal form that's filled in. We look at all the underwriting criteria, uh, loss history, qualifications, et cetera. Um, so it's not to say it's an area we can't assist with, but something where we tread quite lightly. Um, so I hope that addresses your question. Pankaj, I'm happy to send that proposal form through to you. Um, then, Dale, I see there was a question from Nadia. This is addressed to Vim. Um, hmm. She asked, Vim, you have touched on medmal claims in Africa. Do these countries also have regulatory bodies which govern the conduct of the profession, like the HPCSA? What is the approach to deal with transgressions of practitioners? And have there been any challenges in dealing with them as we have on our side experienced in South Africa? Namibia does have a similar body. Um, I've dealt with them on one or two occasions without any, any challenges. And I think it's maybe because it's on much smaller scale. I think in South Africa, um, at right now, medmail claims is sort of the in thing. And um, you don't really see it on the same scale, for example, in Namibia. I don't know about Mozambique. I, I cannot express any opinion in Mozambique. In Lesotho, as far as I'm, I'm aware, I don't think they're really functional on a HPCSA, HPCSA level. The matters that I've seen is, um, is in the civil courts there. And then again, also, it's not on the same scale and volume. Right. Thank, thanks, Vim. Jared, I don't know if you've got a view on Kenya on that point, on, on medical malpractice or not. Yes, yeah, yes, I do. Um, I mean, you know, we're not seeing too many uh, successful claims come through on the uh, on the medical practitioner uh, uh, front. And, and the reason being uh, in, in sectors such as this and other regulated sectors, um, your initial point of contact or body that you have to deal with first um, is, with, when you're talking about medicals, the dentists and medical practitioners board. Now, this is a very strong and collective unit who, who tend to protect one another. And this is where we, we, we tend to see claims um, uh, 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 coming to an end. Now, I think uh, as a result of that, um, uh, perhaps you, you would have seen it on the I2 side, um, the volume of uh, uh, policies, uh, medical, you know, uh, policies being taken out by, by medical practitioners is not particularly high at this point. And this is purely my opinion, but my, my feeling is it is a result of them knowing claims are more likely than not, uh, not going to proceed. Mm. I mean, I mean, on a slightly different point, what we do see, what we've really experienced in Kenya in simple terms is on the medical practitioner side, the, the insurers are issuing a very simple professional indemnity product to the practitioner, which is probably all that's required. But whereas the I2 product is far broader in that it covers the professional indemnity as well as the um, medical malpractice component, as well as the, the general liability. So ours is a much more all-encompassing wording and Mark will be engaging, you know, through APA and the local broking market kind of what those differences are not, differences are and what the benefits are to a kind of a, a more all-encompassing product than just just the PI um, itself. I, I think, uh, you're absolutely right. I think you underpin all, or underpin all of that is, is educating, uh, education rather, and, and educating the market, getting them to understand uh, the benefits of, the poly, of, of, of this particular product. How, how is it different to what already exists in the market and getting them comfortable? And I think with that, over time, you start to see uh, an uptake. Brilliant. That's a very, very cool way to end, Jared, actually. It's a brilliant uh, way to end the, the call and, and it kind of summarizes a lot of really the theme that we wanted really to, to get across today. So thank you so much. There was a really fantastic audience um, and, and uh, appreciate everybody's time, particularly um, our experts from, from Cloud and & Co and, and I2. And uh, yeah, thank, uh, I think we've covered all the questions. I hope so. If not, please drop um, I to a, a note and we'll, we'll certainly get back to you and, and look forward to next week's session, which will also have an Africa theme to it, the last uh, Tuesday of, of May. <laughs>